So I was at a meeting a few weeks ago of leaders in agribusiness, and there was a CEO up here talking to all of us um, and commiserating with all of us in agriculture, and everybody in the room could relate. Uh, he said, and I'm going to quote a few things because I think this is going to resonate in the room. Uh, My company is in the business of feeding a growing world. In an instant, the media can turn everything upside down. If it bleeds, it leads. He used that kind of familiar saying. Science doesn't matter anymore, he said. They're just going to believe what they believe. And it was just the sense of frustration in his voice. Global company, major, you'd know it if I listed it. And it got me to thinking about this Calvin and Hobbes cartoon. So I'm hoping Calvin and Hobbes translates here in Brazil. Certainly cartoons do, because it's something, it, there's, there's a humorous element, but also a truism that's core to us. Um, so here we have Calvin talking to his friend Hobbes, and he says, I'm a genius, but I'm a misunderstood genius. And Hobbes then rightly asks, what's misunderstood about you? And Calvin reflects, nobody thinks I'm a genius. You know, wouldn't it be nice if everybody recognized our need to feed the world and the growing population that we've talked about already in this meeting um, and, and really recognize the genius behind it? And I say that with all seriousness because there are geniuses, way smarter than I am, trying to figure out how we stabilize the world and prevent chaos from happening in, with food insecurity. I mean, that, that's a serious challenge that we face today. So there is genius behind this, and yet um, genius isn't recognized until they trust us. So that's the point of this conversation today, is how do we create trust with consumers at large and millennials specifically? Um, really because you know, food is sacred. So that's the first really big idea here, is food is sacred. It's different than a lot of products that uh, people buy today which makes things like this kind of disconcerting. Things like GMOs, concentrated animal feeding, um, cloning, antibiotics and feed, all of these things kind of upset the consumer in us. Not because these technologies and processes don't hold the promise for food stability and the future of food, but because food is the most personal of products that we use in our lives, which really makes it sacred. I don't need to tell you the trust issue is a global issue. Um, fewer than half of consumers in the UK trust the food industry to provide safe food. 70% of Chinese consumers are concerned about their food supply. Um, and in 2011, there were more than 2,300 product recalls in the U.S., according to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and the U.S. Consumer Product and Safety Commission. So this is all Mintel collected data. Um, so the first thing I'd say is that this mistrust isn't misplaced. It's a reasonable reaction to this product that we sell food, that's sacred, that we put in our bodies and feed our families. And the first thing when we communicate is coming from a place of this is a reasonable expectation that the trust in our industry is um, teetering, maybe is the word for it. Because consumers are mostly concerned about their long-term health. And this is a fundamental challenge in communications because we can't guarantee them in the future, this long, distant future, their health. Um, and anything deemed unnaturally introduced into the food supply initially, and initially is an intentional word, initially creates distrust, creates a sense of threat. Um, and science and logic doesn't help. So that CEO is right. Science and logic at the face value doesn't help. As a crisis counselor at Ketchum always tells our clients, the worst thing you can say to me during a crisis is, in a, and if I'm concerned about something, is, you know, don't worry. It's safe. Go back to doing what you're doing. Not reassuring. And of course, here's the biggest irony, right? Consumers want natural, and we have been an industry that's been very responsive to consumers' desires and wishes, and yet this sense that they have in their head of natural is really at odds 
with the societal, societal demand that's on our industry to produce food for the world and for a growing and increasing uh, population with more disposable income to buy protein and want protein. Um, so uh, this, is, this is the challenge. Protect me from what I want. I'm sure you all saw this, but if not, definitely check out Carnivore's Dilemma in the National Geographic. How many folks have seen this story? Oh gosh, check it out. So the National Geographic, um, a, a stateside magazine, is doing an eight-month series on a variety of foodstuffs and doing a really nice job covering the science of food. So it's a, it's a great case study, I think, throughout the eight months of communications in food. This story in particular is really well done, and the reporter, I think, sets up the di dilemma very clearly. Um, he says, on one side, meat is murder. For public health and the, the health of the planet, we should be producing less. And then he says, on the other side, there are those that say meat is delicious, and it's nutritious, and more people are going to want it in the world because they have a right to want it, and we need to produce more. So this debate is happening right now, and he acknowledges it in the story, and he concludes, here's the inconvenient truth. Feedlots, with their troubling use of pharmaceuticals, being very honest and authentic there, save land and lower greenhouse gas emissions. So he's presenting that tension already that exists, and, and really talking about it openly, candidly. Where do we start? Um, this word, transparency, is completely overused in the food industry. I swear if I hear it one more time, I'm going to go out of my mind. I'm seeing some head nodding. Um, but it is our business reality, because shift has happened. Um, a power shift of, really, millions of individuals um, who now have information at their fingertips, and a lot of information at their fingertips, and they're actively sharing, they're coalescing, they're cajoling, they're changing the marketplace as we sit here in this room. I work for a firm, Ketchum, who has done um, a lot of research in this space to understand what's creating this shift. Um, this piece of work was started in 2008. It's on its third wave of research with consumers in these countries. In 2015, we'll be doing our fourth wave. Why these countries, if anybody's curious? We have offices in 60 countries around the world. These countries in particular raised their hand and said, I want a sample size in my country, so I'm going to contribute money to the cause to research this and understand what's going on so I can share it with my clients in these countries respectively. This research was the first body of work that discovered um, who's kind of creating this tension in the marketplace and, and identified this new segment within the food-involved consumer set, the food-involved consumer being the one that all marketers, all our customers are targeting, they're the food purchaser. And we labeled this consumer the food evangelist. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about these folks. Um, they don't look much different than the food-involved consumer. Um, they're a little bit younger, but half of them are millennials. They're a little more female than a food-involved consumer. Their parents just like the food-involved consumer, and they have a little higher income than the food-involved consumer. Um, so if you're targeting somebody demographically, you're not going to find them in the crowd, per se, by numbers, by kind of demographic markers of age or income. They don't look that much different than food-involved. Um, and yet, while they're only half of the food-involved consumer, they behave very differently, and it's why we think they're very influential and a driving force in this discussion about food today. Their behavior is to self-reported is to push out opinions about food four or more times a week. So the food-involved consumer is absorbing information, you know, primary food shopper, making decisions for themselves, their family, taking in all information, and pretty well informed about food. That, that is my contention. The more I talk to consumers, the more I find, and, and I'm surprised to find, honestly, that they have pretty rich understanding of the food supply. What makes these food evangelists remarkably different is that they're not just making personal decisions for themselves. They want to make decisions for everybody else. So they are pushing their opinions on everybody else. And this is the crowd that's buying more fresh, less, less packaged goods, 
the trend, the shrink in the frozen food case right now, struggling in retail, is because of these folks. They don't want processed foods, and they don't want others to buy processed foods. So they're expressing that angst. They're worried about food processing overall, and they think others should be too. So they're sharing those opinions. You see in research all the time, one of the most trusted sources of information about food is friends and family. It's a kind of that top bar all the time. And our contention, our hypothesis, is it's not any friends and family, not just any old friend and family that we turn to for information. It is the food evangelists in our neighborhood, in our family set that we all turn to for information. It's the people who seem a little bit more red, a little bit more willing to share opinions, and we listen to them thoughtfully and evaluate our decisions against what they're saying. So that makes them highly influential in this discussion about food today. Because half of them are millennials, it's worth taking a look at some millennial data. And this is some work that the US Beef Checkoff did. Kind of an eye chart I get. Um, but what's important here are these red arrows. The millennials in specific are expressing interests and higher concerns than previous generations about animal welfare, how animals are raised, how they're housed, um, beef farming overall and its impact on the environment, looking different than consumers of yesteryear. So we used to think consumers didn't really care about this topic as much as they did about nutrition and taste. This topic is starting to pick up steam, particularly in the new consumer. So the question is, how do you win these folks, these food evangelists that are persuasive in the marketplace? Um, and, and that's the next part of this conversation I'd like to have with you, specifically about how to communicate trust. Um, it begins with focusing on their truth. I know that we're just explaining, for the most part, when we go out and kind of provide voice to our story. We're explaining what we want people to understand about our product, but to them, this sounds very defensive. The explanations sound defensive. So the reality is we have to start with their truth. Well-researched fertile ground here for effective communications is the intersection between our truth and their truth. Defending past actions, talking about what we've done, defending standard practices, not working with this community. Uh, we have to evolve our communications, and it's very consistent with what we're hearing at this meeting, to continuous improvement. How we've improved what we do, how we're improving what we're doing. So it does mean being a little bit more vulnerable. It does mean expressing, here's how we do it today, and here's where we're going in the future. Expressing that future mindset is common ground. Charlie talks about shared values a lot. The shared value of continuous improvement is very real. This work uh, was done by the U.S. Farmers and Ranchers Alliance um, and provides kind of five tenets for effective communications in this, this environment of mistrust and specifically with millennials. Um, convincing our audience that their opinions are wrong just doesn't work. Explaining our point of view passionately and, and with all the confidence in the world doesn't work either. Starting at this place of improvement is, is really a powerful idea. Um, second tenet, being transparent, that overused word makes me crazy, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what I think transparency means for food animal production, and here's what I think it means. And I think it means different things for different industries and even different sectors of food. For food animal production, for beef specifically, it first means access. If I go looking for you, because I do want to hear from you who make process beef, sell beef, raise beef, whatever sector of this industry you belong to, I do want to hear from you. Consumers do want to connect with you. If I can't find you, I assume automatically there's something wrong. Something's gone bad. You're hiding something. The assumption is always to the negative. So being accessible before somebody goes looking for you is a critical tenet of transparency. Authenticity. What what our, my cowboy friends would say is, you know, be real. Just be real. Say it like it is. Um, offer a point of view that is both um, accurate but real, real language, authentic language, okay? 
And then accountability, and I think this is particularly important in raising animals. I've sat in lots of dark rooms listening to consumers, both on the pork side and the beef side, talk about lots of practices in this industry. And at a moment of discovery, they, they step back and they say, I'm assuming that you know this is right, and you know it somehow, and I'm never going to be an expert. Don't expect me to be don't want to be, I can't look over your shoulder 24-7, so I'm going to expect you to be accountable to do what's right and to tell me it. Um, and, and so consumers aren't expecting to know everything that you do and don't really want to know everything you do. They want to know that you're accountable. And that means also telling a story about how you're accountable. Third, um, this concept of precision. You know, we talk a lot about judicious use because that's the word that rolls off our tongue a lot. It's not particularly effective with um, consumers. Judicious is just a funky word that can mean a lot of different things. Uh, what USFRA um, has identified as effective words is precision and even less. If you can communicate less, even better. Around the topics that feel ouchy to consumers. If you can demonstrate that you are precisely Conscious, conscientiously using whatever you're doing or, or practices that you're doing, it reassures consumers, it builds trust. One of the important themes here is not just saying we're being precise, but how you're being precise. I think a fault of communications often is that we draw the conclusions for the consumer instead of letting them get to the conclusion themselves and then believing because they come to that conclusion in their own brain, in their own smarts, that they've made the conclusion. So instead of talking about precise use, and we're continually improving, showing it is more important than saying it. This is a painful eye chart. What I want you to look at is this orange stuff, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about this research here. This was some work that the NCBA, through the, use, through the beef checkoff, did. Um, with millennials specifically around beef production and specifically the feeding operations of beef production. They tested a lot of different concepts and a lot of different tools from video to bloggers to, they tested a lot of stuff, both quantitatively and quantitatively. Lots of things tested positive. These orange ones did not. And in the spirit of precise use, I want to call these out because this is another word I think we need to scrub from our um, our conversations is safe. <laughs> Seems intuitive to talk about safe when we're talking about what we're doing. I will tell you every time we use this word, consumers say that doesn't make me comfortable. And it's kind of a that's a that's a shocker I think for all of us in communications because we want to say the FDA has determined it's safe, our own science has determined it's safe. We've been using it for 50 years and we know it's safe. Nothing has ever happened and it's safe. And consumers say but you don't really know. And so the skepticism is automatic. Um, and I would suggest that instead of, again, drawing those conclusions to safety or well-being, show consumers what you do and let them draw the conclusions themselves. Talking about education is a really powerful idea and platform. Talking about how there is learning that happens on the farm and in the plant and in the store, in the restaurant. Talking about how that happens is a powerful idea because what consumers assume is that we're set in our ways, we're stuck in our mud, um, and we don't change unless we're forced to change. So talking about how we're always training people to do better is a great platform for earning trust. And then finally, the fifth one is championing and, and calling for more research, and then not just calling for it, but actually doing the research and applying the research and showing that sense of continuous improvement through research is also a powerful concept for trust building. We're telling our clients be listeners first and talk second. Um, so don't jump into this conversation with, you know, full arms um, and armament, but rather Watch the tone, watch the conversation, and really dissect the best entry point for you. Um, and begin by acknowledging concerns, um, understanding, sharing that common ground, that indeed I understand why you would be concerned about something like that. And then really taking actions that demonstrate you're authentically looking to improve and you're accountable to the food supply and the safety of the food supply. And then sharing all that. <laughs>
sharing it in advance before people go looking. We call this the breadcrumb strategy at my firm. It's about laying down those breadcrumbs like Little Red Riding Hood did so she could find her way back, laying down those breadcrumbs so that when somebody goes looking, they find you and they find others who corroborate the sense. So it creates a sense of community that there is indeed good things going on in the beef industry.